So good afternoon and welcome everyone to this another evening when we have a very, very interesting conversation, which of course you're going to be a part of. It's our fireside conversation and we are focusing this year at our boys, loving our boys, because if they, we don't show them love, how can they then go and demonstrate love? And so I'm going to invite you at this time to just bow your heads as we as we begin with prayer. So could we just acknowledge God's presence? Father, we thank you for another wonderful afternoon when we come, Lord God, to look at our country, Jamaica, the land we love, and the 23rd Division, and where our boys fit into that. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for direction. We ask you, Lord, for a wonderful, wonderful afternoon together as we, Lord, will look at our boys. What can we do? What have we not done that we, are, we need to do? Guide us, Lord, in all that we do this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome um, to the platform some very special people this afternoon. But before I go there, I'm going to invite, uh, we have Mrs. Alison Solomon, who is our, Red, our Senior Director in the Teacher Development Services, who is going to be bringing us greetings. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Winsome Gordon, the Chief Executive Officer for the Jamaica Teaching Council, as she talks to us about the boys program, how it all started and what is it, where are we going as um, the council, our interest in the boys and some of the activities that we're doing that you, of course, will need to collaborate. I want to thank you for taking the time off. It's Sunday afternoon to join us for this conversation. And of course, we're going to be hearing later on from Dr. Herbert Gale, from Mr. Heron, and we also have Mr. Peter Morgan. We have um, Carla here from Stand Up Jamaica. We have quite a few persons who would have been working with boys, working in the field, working in different areas so that we all can make Jamaica the place to live, work, do business, raise our families. Over to Mrs. Alison Solomon. Mrs. Solomon. Yes, thank you, Ingrid. And I want to welcome everybody to this space. It's an official welcome. And the fact that we can have over 300, almost 400 and climbing persons here uh, on a pre-Valentine Sunday evening is really testimony to the fact that this topic is really something that is, you know, we, is current and crucial. And we are happy to be you, August of two. And so this is our Jamaica Teaching Council way of saying that everybody is important. We're leaving no one behind. We are cognizant of the issues there. And so we are we are advancing voice program, which our CEO, Dr. Gordon, will talk to you some more about, is very dear to our hearts. And so without further ado, happy, happy pre-Valentines to you all and welcome to this space. Thank you so much, Mrs. Solomon. So whether you celebrate Valentine's Day or not, uh, what's important to us is that you celebrate love. And so I want to ask at this time that we have our CEO, Dr. Winsome Gordon, join us as she shares with us um, you know, her passion, um, her dream becoming a reality, and just where we are on this path as we look at our boys. Dr. Winsome Gordon, over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's just nice to see you on a Sunday evening. And I remember the long ago days when we really used to meet on Sunday evenings in Jamaica and talk about issues and, and try to resolve issues as communities. I, I hope the day will come and we'll go back to our community platforms and discussions. The, let me start out by saying, if you knew about me and about my life between 1993 and 2006, you'd see that I'm an, I was an advocate for girls. And I'm still an advocate for girls' education. In Africa, Asia, Arab states, I was in the forefront for girls' education. But when I came home to Jamaica and I looked at the situation of our boys, I said, we have a problem. And we have a problem that is different from much, much of the rest of the world. Our boys, need help. In fact, our boys need love. And so we had national discussions, brought in the British Council, the Commonwealth Secretariat, they were the first to say yes, 
the Commonwealth Secretariat was brave enough to say, all right, let us work together with Jamaica and boys education because they began to find out that boy, the problem of boys education existed in some other areas that we didn't know about. So the, the program was born in 2014. We had a launch at the arena and the business community, I must say, they came out and joined us because they realized that we, we have a problem with the achievement level, levels of our boys and with the education system responding to the needs of our boys. When we are putting nearly 2,000 young boys in the prisons every year, <laughs> what is that? A tertiary level? Because they finish secondary education and they go to prison. And I went to the jails to see, some jails to see the boys. And when I saw them, they were just standing up. There was no, not even enough space for them to lie down. And so I recognized, no, Jamaica, we must do something about your boys. And so the program was launched. And then we heard from the boys themselves. And you know, something that boys said that really stuck in my mind, that we need law and order. Boys said that. We need law and order. Our programs should be organized. Boys were expressed there interest in vocational education, hands-on activities, but they weren't getting enough of what they really wanted. And they're still, we are still behind. We are not there yet because music, the music industry is not a part, an integral part of our education system as yet, because by no boys should be writing songs, really good songs. They should have good tunes, you know, but we did not take on music as an industry. We had music as, as a, a subject and you, you could learn your music and so on, but not the industry. And that is where we sometimes fail our boys that those areas that they would like to engage in and they will engage in after school, we don't have in the school's education program. So we're working on that and our ministers behind all this. She wants to see the boys do well. And what we notice is that in the vocational areas, they did very well in whether it's CXC or City and Gills, the boys did very well in those areas. But then when the schools brag about the performance of their children, they, they would leave out the performance of the technical vocational areas. Uh, they would speak about those students who achieve 11 c sex subjects, then 12 and 10, and forget that when a boy gets a distinction in joinery, that's an achievement. So it, it, the, the problem is complex. It is on all sides. There are many sides to the story and we can fix it. We have been doing our best to fix it. We are getting there one step at a time. I promised myself, I want to see the boys off the street corner. I want to see them taken off the street corners and put in, put in some kind of, of, of work but they have to be trained and, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to tell you something. When we asked the teachers many years ago to just give one word to describe boys, out of 100, I think it was 163 teachers, only three teachers had anything positive to say about the boys. They're troublesome, they're rude, they're out of order, they can't bother with them. And, and so we had to work on the teachers to get them to understand that boys are just different. They're not all the bad things. So I can, I can assure you that today, if you could speak to our teachers, they would tell you that they'll be more positive. In fact, two years later, after we implemented the program, we did the same exercise and the teachers were more positive about the boys. And we are very happy about that. So we are getting there. The challenges of parenthood, they are great. Because just when the boys need love, just when the boys need understanding, they need care. You know, when they are 15, 16, 17, and they, 
the, the macho, the fight between the young rooster and the old rooster and the mother has to go in between because the poor boy wants love and care and the father is rigid and, you know, telling the boy what he wants. And also that is the age when some mothers want boys to go out and earn and help the little ones. And they cannot understand, oh, a 17 year old boy can be so lazy because they don't understand he's growing, he's developing, he has lots of complexities in his thoughts, you know, all those things. So this program, we are with, in this program, we are working with everybody, the parents, the boys, the teachers, to get them to understand that our boys are not born bad. <laughs> and so we need to work with them. We need to help them. And I must say phase two of the program, where we are now, this mentoring phase, entrepreneurship, Mrs. Wilmot is the driver behind the phase two of the, phase two of the program with the help of Mr. Chin, Lunry Chin, and of course, under the leadership of her director, they are working with new issues for the boys. Our boys are good. We need fathers for their children, our children. We need husbands. Daddy not available is not good enough for us. And so, ladies and gentlemen, as we gather this evening, let us think out of the box. Let us love our boys. Let us spread the message of love. They don't always do what we want them to do, but we can guide them. And I, I can assure you, Love is one of the most powerful tools that God has given to us. So I look forward to this evening discussion, but do have a wonderful evening. Enjoy it. Thank you, Mrs. Wilmot. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. Yes, yeah, she's passionate about this and it's contagious, you will see. I really appreciate that. And so as we continue this conversation, I'm going to now invite Mr. Davian Leslie. Mr. Leslie is our Chief Professional Development Officer of the Jamaica Teaching Council. You see at the Jamaica Te Teaching Council, we're a team. Where one goes, we all go, right? We work together as a team. And so Mr. Leslie will be doing for us an activity at this time. Mr. Leslie, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wilmot. Um, today is Sunday, so I think I can call you Ingrid. Um, <laughs> we're not at work today. We're not at work today. And look here, I come to change of things today now. Uh, let this talky talky. Dr. Gordon, I, I was going to say today is Sunday, so I think I can call you Winsome, but I won't risk it. I won't risk it. Greetings and salutations, Dr. Gordon. <laughs> Let me greet all the participants who are here. Let me just thank you for coming. I really am just so happy to be here. I'm gonna ask for three volunteers very quickly. Can I get, just raise your hand. You don't know what to ask in your for. I would love to have three boys, but quite frankly, I'm prepared to take any three persons who read the water heap of hand going up. He's three, me ask for, you know, what am I gonna do now? All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to ask if you're not a boy and you have raised your hand, put it down. Let me see if I have three boys. If you're not a boy and your hand is raised, you can put it down so I can find three boys. I see Mikhail Pottinger. Mikhail. I'm going to, I'm going to ask that they make you co-host. I see, is that Coyote? Yes, Coyote. Coyote. Did I say that right? Coyote, I got that right? Yes, you did. Yes, sir. Great, great. And is that Daniel? I see Daniel Coyote. Close your mic. You're a co-host, so you can open and close at will. Is that Daniel? I see Daniel. Yes, sir. Great, great, excellent, excellent. Look here now. We are going to have a little sound clash. You hear? We're gonna have a little sound clash. You following me? Look here. So this afternoon is about boys and about love, and this is reggae month as well, by the way. And so. I think it would be useful if we have a little sound clash. What is this sound clash going to be about now? So this is the order in which we will do it. Mikhail, are you still there? Yes, sir. Good, good. Mikhail, how old are you, Mikhail? Sir, 12. Yeah, 12 years old. What school are you at, Mikhail? The Cartwright College. The Cartwright College out there in Mandeville. Excellent, excellent. Coyote, how old are you? I'm 12 years old, and I yes. attend the Mineral Heights School. Mineralized Primary, is that Mineralized High? Mineralized Primary School. Primary, excellent, excellent. You're in grade six, aren't you? 
Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. You're preparing for PEP. I know you're gonna do well, Coyote. Daniel. Yes, sir. Are you still there? Yes, sir. What grade are you, Daniel? I'm in grade eight, sir. Grade eight. Which school is that now? Monroe College. Monroe College. Look here, the, 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 the Philistines are up on us, man. The Region 5 team is out. So we have Region 5, two from Region 5, that is Daniel and Mikhail. Daniel, how old are you? That makes you 13. 11 years old, sir. You said how much? 11 years old, sir. Daniel, you are 11 years old and in grade eight? Yes, sir. Good, 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 good. So it's Daniel, Coyote, and Mikhail. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to think of some songs, some songs that have to do with, with love. Some songs that have to do with love. The songs must be reggae or Jamaican songs. I'm going to say reggae or dancehall. And I'm going to say dancehall, but I'm going to caution you. Remember, you are in a space where everybody is listening to you. So I don't want any song that is inappropriate. You're following me? Coyote, Daniel? Yes, sir. Mikhail, good, good. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think of as many songs as you want that have to be, that, can, that, is, that are about love. And we're going to have a little sound clash in, ten, in, in 20 seconds. I'm giving you 20 seconds to think of your songs. And we're going to go in this order. Mikhail, Coyote, Daniel, and you will just go, go around and sing your songs. The songs can be gospel, they can be reggae, they can be dancehall. I'm going to even go as far as to say you can make them hip hop and, 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 and songs that are not necessarily reggae. But let's go again. Think about some songs that have to do with love. I'm giving you 20 seconds to think of your song. And then one after the other, I'm going to ask you to sing your song until, until you run out a song. You can't repeat somebody else's song. The person who has the last song standing is the winner. That's what a song clash is. Are you following me, Mikhail? Daniel? Coyote? Yes, sir, but do you, yes, sir, but do you have to know the song by heart? No, no, you just need to sing one line of the song. One line of the song. Just okay. one or two lines so everybody can get this. Yeah, man, no problem, man. I just want to make sure that Coyote, Mikhail, and Daniel, your, your parents are, we'll are, are the, in the house are, are around. But we, no worry, man, we have your prayers for you. Don't worry. So Mikhail, Coyote, Daniel, are you ready? Yes, sir. You're sure, Coyote, you're ready? Yes, sir, I'm ready. You sound tune up. Mikhail, are you ready? Zariba, are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, Mikhail will go first. Mikhail? One love. Go through, Mikhail. Let's on, get sing. together and feel all right. Yes, Mikhail. You want love. some shot, Mikhael. That is a great song, Mikhael. Let's go, Coyote. Coyote. Yes, sir. Could you be loved by Bob Morley? Sing the song could from you, over your recital. Could you be sing loved. the song, man. Um, could you be loved? Yes, some big pull up a garden at the chat for yes. that coyote. That is obviously, obviously a song of Daniel. What's your response? Is this love? Is this love? Is this love? Love that I'm feeling. Boy, Daniel, that song they sound like. Isn't that the same one that that that, that Mikhail sing? We're asking the judges to check that before before we, we move on. But let's move on and come back. Mikhail Zareeb, either one of you ready with your next song? All right, Mikhail Zareeb, you did well. You had one song and you sang it well. Thank you very much. Coyote, you are up next. Love Lady by uh, Kenny Rogers. Sing the song, man. Sing the song. My love, my shining armor, <laughs> and you love you. You are me. Coyote. Coyote, the people them say it's your mother telling you that song and not Coyote. The no, people say you don't know that ever. song. <laughs> Coyote, the people that say you don't know that song, Coyote. You don't even know who named Kenny Rogers. But yes, I yes, do. I, I, say, I sang him for my, uh, uh, my basic school thing. Basic, basic school. Song, so. It was like last week. All right, Coyote, you did well. You did well. <laughs> Daniel, we hear you have a nice voice, Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. Your song now, quick, quick. I love you, Lord. For no, man, you have to continue, man. Fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands. But Daniel, Daniel, you could just Daniel, Daniel, we could just stop the program and make you sing, you know. 
That could be it, Daniel. You are an artist, Daniel. You come here to sing this evening, man. No worry. All right, Coyote, yeah. we're back to you. Mikhail Zarib, you're out. I'm sorry. Coyote, one more song from you. Tune for tune. Tune for tune, Coyote. You are up. Oh, yeah. Five, oh, yeah. I, I four, three, two. So far, now you used to be four. Mm, what? No, 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 that kind of sound like you have. Yet sound like you have backup band behind you. Wait. So is what that now? I know Coyote voice that. Daniel, go ahead, Daniel. Original, original voice, Daniel. You're not playing anything. Jesus loves me. Classic. That is the classic. For the Bible tells that is a classic. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that, Daniel. Nothing more than that. Let us just see if Coyote has a response. Thank you, Daniel. Last one and then we're finished. Coyote, any response? Oh, yeah. Three, two. I don't, I don't have any more. I don't have any more. You sorry. don't have any more. You don't have any more. All right, Daniel. Close it up for us, Daniel. Take it over for us, Daniel. Look, one last one, Daniel. Okay, Daniel, so and so and pop them too. Daniel? All right, no problem. I think we have a winner, though. Straight from the heart. Okay, that one sound like is your mother telling you to Daniel, but that is fine, no problem. No problem. All right, Daniel, you, you did well. Guys, you, you all did very well. Daniel, Coyote, Mikhail, meet me in the chat. I'll, I'll organize with you for your prizes, okay? Meet me in the chat in five minutes. Mrs. Wilmot, I'm giving you back your program, please, thanks. Thank you so very much. All right, and so at this time, I'm going to be inviting Mrs. Latoya, um, um, sing to share with us the outline. And I hope you have your glass of wine. And for you young ones, have your, your chocolate, um, your, your hot chocolate, because we're having our five side conversation. Great start. And we want to continue and end it this way where we are so engaged and we are going to leave being informed and ready to make a difference. And just to say that, we're also going to be monitoring the live um, chat going on in on our YouTube channel because you two will be getting prizes. So someone will be monitoring that. And of course, we want to post the links out there also so that no one is left behind. This is an inclusive space. And again, I want to thank you for joining us. So as I said before, we have this afternoon, um, three gentlemen who will be sharing. Um, two, um, we have Dr. Herbert Gale and Mrs. Singh and Mrs. Anissa Wilson will be introducing them very soon. And then we also have a gentleman who would have gone the path, a young man who felt unloved, who felt rejected to the prison path or ended up in prison back out and he's telling his story. And so we also have him to share with us. So I want to encourage you to, you know, just tune in and we will invite you to share in the conversation. I'm gonna invite Mrs. Mrs. Latoya, sing Miss Anissa Williams at this, Wilson, I'm sorry, at this time to share with us um, some more about these gentlemen. Um, we'll start with Dr. Gale and Mr. Joseph Heron. Uh, after we've heard from them, we're going to be inviting Mr. Peter Morgan to also share. Over to you, ladies. All right. Good afternoon again. I will be introducing Dr. Gale. Dr. Herbert S. Gale. Dr. Gale is a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. He is a trained as a social anthropologist who specializes in social violence, that is gangs, murder-suicide, repeat killers, and domestic violence. He has over two and a half decades of experience living with and studying youth gangs and transnational criminal organizations in 17 countries in the Caribbean, Central America, USA, Europe, and Asia. He has impacted policies in three Caribbean states to reduce social violence, worked with six international law firms to reduce deportation to Jamaica, and has helped to guide international development partners and foreign governments 
to focus aids on the poorest and most vulnerable people with special emphasis on abused mothers and boys. He has been interviewed by over 30 international media houses, including BBC and Associated Press. Dr. Gale is also a methods expert, trained at the advanced level in all four approaches, qualitative, quantitative, mixed, and participatory, and action research. As a violence expert and youth advocate, Dr. Gale has done public lectures, motivational presentations, workshops, and seminars in over 50 countries. As an advocate of Black Gender Partnership, he has, he has been a keynote speaker at 16 International Women's Day events, where he has stressed the need for women to enter politics to provide a cognitive balance to the current lopsided frame of male politics political leadership. He has also been the strategist for six women who have successfully entered governments in three countries. He has done over 70 major studies and has published several books, chapters, and articles, including the recent work on males and tertiary education in Jamaica launched in October, 2020. He is a chairman of Fathers Incorporated and a Children's First Agency and sits on various commissions, task forces, and advisory councils aimed at national and regional development. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Herbert Gill. Good afternoon, everyone. The pleasure is mine to welcome our panelists Mr. Joseph Heron. Joseph is an educator who has served in a myriad of capacities within the Jamaica's education system. He started working in education as a teacher of Spanish and physical education at the St. Hughes Preparatory School in 1994. He graduated in 1999 with a Bachelor's of Arts in psychology from the University of the West Indies, after which he enrolled at the Michael Teachers College, where he read for his diploma in education. Joseph worked at Marvely Primary and Junior High School, where he stayed until assuming the role of guidance counselor at the Penwood High School in January 2002. While at Penwood, he was awarded a scholarship to pursue postgraduate studies at the University of Melbourne. At the University of Melbourne, he completed a master's degree in youth health and education management with a focus on boys' education. Joseph has also been a certified football referee since 2006. After eight years at Penwood High School, Joseph moved to the Haley Selassie High School as Dean of Discipline. And during his time at both Penwood and Haley Selassie, Joseph established and monitored several programs, including the Boys Club, After School and Summer School Personal Transformation Programs. Now with the assistance of physical education, drama, the assistance of teachers, these programs, they utilize sports, poetry, and drama as key components to reach all male students. Joseph is also involved with the Caribbean Male Action Network, Cariman, as country representative for Jamaica. Cariman is a network of individuals and organizations that advocate around issues affecting boys and men. He works with the Boys Mentorship Program at the Jamaica Teaching Council as a certified mentor for boys. He has facilitated a session on teaching to the male brain to educators and male students in the Jamaica Teaching Council's Advancing Boys Education. And he's an avid supporter of the initiative. He's very knowledgeable, committed, and passionate about boys' education. 
he continues to work with many organizations and continues to empower our boys. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to introduce Joseph to you. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you both. So we will now go over to Dr. Gale. So Dr. Gale, share with us as we look this afternoon at you know, the topic of our boys and what's happening in Jamaica based on your area of research, your expertise. Let's hear from you, sir. Then we go right over to Mr. Heron. All right, let me just say good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. All right, all right. So uh, I, will just, I will just take a few minutes. Uh, I'm assuming that I should, that this is an introductory presentation from me. Uh, so I'll just speak for a few minutes and let you know what we've been seeing. Uh, if I'm, I've, been, I've been tracking for the last 28 years what's been happening in the region in terms of how we treat boys. And what seemed to be the biggest problem is a lack of recognition by policymakers and everyone around uh, that people came out of slavery uh, equally. And let me let me let me put that another way for you. So if you look at if you look at gender issues in Europe, uh, in Asia, in other parts of the world, you will not see material as similar or realities as similar to ours. What happens here, though, is that many people simply don't get it in their heads that men and women were slaves in Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. And, and if you notice, I, I, uh, in another session, I'll show you the trajectory. You'll see that uh, by 1970, right, when you assess the situation in Jamaica, women were made up 64. Uh, there were 64 women to every 100 men in tertiary education. And that's in the 1970s. But if you notice within half, a, half of a century, Within 50 years, what you see is to every 100 men in tertiary education, there's a matter of 228 women. And, and that transition came about because if, and I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to your sense of logic here, if two sets of people came out of a system equally and 80% of, of anything called development is marked WAG. WAG means women and girls. Then you can understand how easy it is to tilt the situation. Now, what I find fascinating uh, in all of this is the matter of how we treat things. So if you look at, if you look at boys and the way we relate to them, one of the first things you will see is, is a narrowing of any pathway they can take. If you start with uh, the school system, you, you will first understand that what we have for those who are outside of the Caribbean, what you have as grammar schools in Jamaica is, is very much gendered. There are seven all-boy schools in Jamaica and 15 all-girl schools. Now, why would that have happened? If you look at the three, the four phases of building schools in Jamaica, uh, you could start from, uh, you could start from, of course, Wilmers and Manning's High School in Savannah Lamar. And the first thing you would see is in the first phase of education in the region uh, is that there was no space for girls. The schools were built exclusively for boys, but these boys were exclusively white. And then if you look at the second phase of education in the region, uh, you would see that schools were built for white boys and white girls. And then by the time you get to the third phase, which would be the end of slavery, you would see that there was a massive concern that indentured servants that replaced slaves were not enough to keep the plantations going. And therefore, if you look at the grammar schools built, you'd have seen only Calabar and a couple other schools built, but you'd have seen 10 schools built for girls. And then as you move to phase four, what you would see uh, is, 
uh, schools being transformed from boys' schools to co-ed schools and schools being transformed from school from a school for boys that ended up becoming a school for girls. And that school was, of course, created by Miriam Speed. It's now called the Merle Grove. So it's interesting as you look at all of this structuring, a structuring to ensure that boys uh, were kept very close to labor, uh, but at the same time, a shutdown of girls ensuring through patriarchy that they were not, that they also did not have access. But then we had a very beautiful decade in terms of revolutionary changes in Jamaica uh, called the 70s. And of course, we had a couple, uh, a prime minister who, who was very close to, uh, uh, to his wife called Beverly Manley, who advised him very strongly about gender. And, and so the 1974 election would have been the first election in Jamaica that included matters related to gender. And that became a trigger. Now, I want to take you to what I call phase five, which is a group of people called IDPs. IDPs are international development partners. And since the 1970s, they have pumped tremendous amount of money in, into Jamaica, but those monies are marked WAG, women and girls only. The problem with Caribbean people is that they have been price takers. And let me explain this, this economic term and how it applies to the anthropology of our education system. Price takers are the people who are so vulnerable, so dependent, so, so gullible, and believe me, I make no apology for that word, that they sit and take whatever the North tells them. So if you look at countries like Belize, Trinidad, Jamaica, El Salvador, Guatemala, and any of the 17 countries that I've worked in, you will see this very directly, where whatever the North has, whatever they interpret to be, whatever is needed for your development is what you take from them. And when I sit with now, I have now, I have now have meetings with uh, nine different IDPs, they have actually blamed us for not having an agenda for ourselves. Let me say that again very slowly. They, we have blamed them for directing monies away from boys. And we've actually gone to the extent of accusing them of continuing the mental slavery. They, in turn, in my meetings with them that they've, they've, they've invited me to, they've, that's brave of them, I should commend them, they in turn have blamed us for taking anything that they have on board because we cannot wait to draw down the monies for our development. So, so what's happening here? If you are socialized, economically and socially socialized, to be a price taker, to accept that the NART knows what's good for you, and you have not made the transition cognitively from being ruled to self-rule, we are going to continue to see the destruction of boys because the monies are not going to come from the North that are marked boys included. These monies are going to be marked WAG, W-A-G. I've actually seen the, 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 the term literally on paper. So let me share with you before I, I close my introduction. Uh, my last three meetings with international development partners have been very steamy, in which I have become emotional and said to them, you know, you know, you have been accused of continuing slavery with your development money. And, uh, you know, and, and two of them so far have been very kind to my aggressive and honest presentation to them. And this is what has, has turned out to be the situation. What is development, Dr. Gale? What is the development that Jamaicans, Belizean, Trinis, Guatemalans, what is, what is the development that they seek? And I had to be honest to such a, such a powerful question that most, most governments do not know. And most governments in the region 
do not consult persons who are trained. Most governments I know would not invite a Winsome Garden or a Herbert Gale. They won't. Most governments operate at the level called gut feelings, gut feelings. And they also operate at the level where they work with persons they are comfortable with. Now, people who are scientists are usually very nerdy and unapologetic for presenting what the data say, which I'm going to take you through a little bit later, but this is just my introduction. The point is that if we don't change the sense of governance within the region and get governments that have heirs and, and lack the arrogance that de denies us our development, then we have a problem when we begin to speak with IDPs. The other problem lies in the fact that your development should not have been hinged on IDPs in the first place. Because if an IDP is working in China or India, that IDP does not make the adoption to a Caribbean space. But if you look at, I can tell you, I can take you to 10 different massive parts of government or agencies within government that are doing well. And I can tell you of that 10, eight, eight to 10 would be funded almost exclusively by international development partners. And so A, we are, we've developed a system that depends on them very heavily for loans, for development monies. B, we refuse to set an agenda that is declared to them that this is my agenda and I ask of you humbly to fit in my agenda. We continue to be price takers and that's where it lies. And so when you have a meeting with an IDP and you preach like Paul and you preach like, 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 like Jesus on the, on the mount, you will hear at the end of that meeting, we're sorry, Dr. Gale, for the next three years, the monies are marked WAG. And that's the core of the nightmare of what's happening to boys. Today, we are seeing a lot of women beginning to realize that, we, that there's something wrong. A woman said to me in 2015, right, uh, as I did a presentation on International Women's Day, she came to me afterwards, she hugged me and she said, I would like my daughter to have an MA and an MAN. And I've been talking to this country and this region for quite a while on this matter. And she said to me, but I would also like my son to have dollars and also have cents. And those two, those two descriptions have become very offensive to some persons who live by propaganda rather than reality. All of us, all of us must begin this journey of understanding that if you don't have a balance, as my father left, we're going to be in trouble if we don't have balance. As my father left Savile Lamar to go to Bluefields for three weeks, I asked him, what will happen to the pigeons we have if we're going on the farm to work? He says, they'll be fine. I will simply cut one of their wings and they will walk around because they won't be able to fly. And I cried. It's one of, one of the things I've written in my stories that I cried about. I cried as I watched my father cut the wings of those birds from the cage and let them out. They thought they were free. They simply could not fly. It didn't matter what they did. When we came back, they were free. They had food. They could walk around because food was on the ground. Food, a lot of food was left for them to eat, but they could not fly. I've said to Caribbean people, if you cut the wings of boys, your countries will not fly. That's my introduction. We'll come back. Oh, if I could really sing like Daniel, I would just sing now. I believe I can fly. Dr. Gale, you can join me. 
I believe I can touch the sky, but I don't have any wings. Over to you, Mr. Heron. As we now hear from Mr. Heron, his perspective, you had us all on our on the edge of our seat as we listened to the facts, the data, as you would have gathered them. So Mr. we go now to Mr. Heron, then we're gonna hear from Mr. Peter Johnson, and then just um, a brief, <laughs> and then we come back to the gut of it. So I see Mr. Heron, you're out on the beach, sir. I hope you have your, I don't know what you have, but I have my glass of wine. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wilmot. And, and thank you, everybody. Um, greetings all. Greetings all. Um, yes, this is, a, this is a very important topic that we need to, to look into. And I think Dr. Gale would have, would have given a very um, global perspective. Wonderful, Dr. Gale. Um, I'm going to come a bit closer home um, and while we're talking about our boys, it is critical that we, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be fairly brief. Before they start high school, we have to understand that they, they, a lot of boys, not all boys, you can't put all the boys in the same, in, on, under the same blanket. A lot of our boys are simply not starting at the same level. They're not starting where they're supposed to start. They're starting at a disadvantage. And because of that, they, they continue along the same trajectory along um, whether it is behind in, in schoolwork, in emotional capacity, you name it, they are behind. And, it, and, 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 and our system is not responding to these needs. Our system are not responding. Education system is not responding. The family system is not responding. The criminal justice system is not responding. And so what is happening is exactly what um, Dr. Gale is speaking about, exactly what Mrs. Gardner is speaking about as well with regards to boys being in jail, boys being left out of the education system, fathers not, not following their children, or fathers simply not being, not being um, not, 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 not pulling their weight. And this is where we are. And if we don't respond critically, if we don't respond methodically, then it is going to get, only going to get worse. If we continue to depend on the international funders to, to direct where we want to go or where they want us to go, I should say, it will only get worse. And I don't see, I don't see it making much sense. So we we really have to be very pointed and we really have to stop and do stop to doing what we're doing now. We have to go back into our teachers' colleges to see how we're educating. And we 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 can't continue to just focus on the boys alone because it is affecting everybody, not just our girls. How are we teaching every single person? How are we delivering? How are we teaching our educators to deliver education? We, we can't limit it to just one aspect. We can't limit it to education alone. Our family structure has broken down totally where the men are not as important. Fathers are not being valued the way that they're supposed to be valued and therefore they're not as involved. Now, we know that there are many fathers who are not simply pulling their weight, but if we continue just pulling it on fathers alone, we're in a, we're in a very, very dark corner and that will not change. So if we only focus on our education system, we can't adapt. We know boys are coming into our system unprepared. The, the, the study that was done recently, most of the boys who are in prison, most of the men who are in prison, they are underfathered or unfathered, but they're also uneducated and un undereducated. So that combination, family and education, we need to fix both of them or else our criminal justice system will continue to be overwhelmed with the number of boys. And this is where we need to focus on. This is where we have, we have to, we're losing, we're, we're really losing out. And I don't see how we're going to continue if, as, 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 as Dr. Gay just said, it's, it's only piecemeal response we're giving to, to the system. Yeah, so that is where I'll start and I'll end right there. Thank you, Mrs. Wilma. Thank you so much, Mr. Heron. Always just so good to hear from you. And T, um, I mean, the, the space is when we look in the chat and we see what's going on there, uh, we understand the, you know, how, how much we need to have this conversation and not just to talk here, but when we leave here to move into action. I'm going to segue now to hear from someone who has walked the path, the path of pain, the path of rejection, needing love, and we will get his introduction as we go in. We will hear some more. So we'll now invite Mr. Peter Johnson to share with us his journey 
or at least the first leg of his journey. Over to you, sir. So I'm going to ask that Mr. Mr. Dr. Gale, if you'll continue and then we go back to Mr. Heron as I sort out with Mr. Johnson. Over to you, sir. We're going to be taking questions. Um, we're going to be inviting persons to share, but I'm going to ask that the gentlemen um, continue their conversation and then we pick up from there. Over to you, Dr. Gale. Uh, may I have permission to share something with you? You are a co-host, so you can screen share. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I want, to, I want to share with you just a little bit of what's been happening with boys. Uh, if, you, if you look, that is a situation of violence in Jamaica. It's not going down. It's heading in one direction. Uh, but I want to just share with you a little bit of the ACs, the situation, adverse child uh, experiences uh, that we've seen very recently, as in this study is a 2022 study just completed 2021-2022, 54% of the students in the study reported having adverse childhood experiences, and this is broken down into 13% of students who reported all forms of violence on the WHO typology chart, physical, sexual, psychological, and neglect, or sexual abuse with other forms of violence. 12% who reported all forms of violence except sexual, 15% who reported severe neglect and or physical and our psychological violence. So there's a lot of violence among our children. When we look at the, the, the specific schools, uh, the schools that are, we know, of course, we have the grammar schools, our traditional schools, and the new secondary schools. We'll see that all new secondary school groups had 10% or more of their students would experience uh, most severe levels, the most severe levels of, of ACs. Again, ACs mean adverse childhood uh, experiences. And of course, the poorest schools are the schools that performed the least, had the most of the problem. But here's where, here's where it has struck a lot of us. One in six girls, a 17% of girls in the study reported being sexually abused at some point in her life, and one in 10 boys. I'm sharing this with you, right, as we go along and we, we share bits and bits, because I want you to wake up. I want you to be woke. I've come to recognize that Caribbean people live so much on the internet that they really have very little idea of truth or, or reality. And as I listen to people and they speak about sexual abuse, which is a third bar by WHO, physical violence or physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual ab abuse and, and deprivation. So the third one is the big one that is graphic to all of us. But we always only talk about girls. But look at the gap, one in six girls, one in 10 boys. And I'm going to share something with you that should be surprising. Boys were more likely than girls to experience extreme abuse. That's what we expect, right? Income was also important. So, so the poor were almost, had far more bad experiences than, than those from the, the upper classes. But here's where it struck hard. When we took, when we took uh, poor inner city boys and mapped them against poor inner city girls to see what was happening, we found right no poor boy from an inner city community reporting had could say that they had no ACs. So when we let, let's go again, when we went to the inner city, the inner city group of boys in the study, zero. Let's put it another way. Every single inner city boy whose parents were poor, because inner city do have near poor people, and poor means that the parents are unemployed, are marginally employed, are unskilled. Every single boy in that group suffered immense adverse childhood experiences. Yet 42% of the girls had no such experience. They were shielded and protected. I want you to understand that. I'm explaining to you why the system is now showing one of four, one of four, and one of five, and one of six people who attend university today are inner city girls. When it comes to boys, it's one of 40 and one of 50. 
That's what I'm explaining to you, how much the doors are shut against boys. But the strangest finding in this very recent study is that when we go, when we compared inner city boys whose parents were poor, again, unemployed or marginally employed, we found 33% of those boys, as they take to the streets to hustle for themselves, were sexually abused, compared to 25% of girls in the same group sexually abused. This is the first time in 28 years of research that we found a single group of boys who are more sexually abused than girls. When you look at U16, and I'm looking at sex, because that's the area where that pulls the massive funding. And the point I'm making is that the fundings are, the funders are misinformed. When we take U16 sex, which has been a concern in Jamaica for the last 50 years, U16 sex means that the child has sex before the age of consent, which is 16 years in terms of legality in Jamaica. When, when, you, look at, when you look at that data, you will see that the, yeah. the, early, the early study, 2008, showed 49% of males having sex before age 16. When you look at the 2020 preliminary, the Faculty of Social Sciences Male Fertility Study preliminary, you see that increase to 64%. Now, stay with me. In the preliminary, 42% of boys' first sex is with an adult. 23% are over the age of 21. Females, unlike males, have made tremendous strides. Let's go to the 2016 Women's Health Survey, which is not my work. And that shows that women have dropped from 24% for three decades ago to 14%. Immense strides on the side of the females. Okay? While for the males, their early sex has increased in terms of proportion. 33% of females who have under 16 sex were forced, 20% for boys. The gap I am appealing to us to, to, to get woke, to wake up, the gap between boys and girls in this area that we make this massive, this is the platform on which funding is based, is nowhere near as wide as we think. I will leave it there and come back to some of the other data I want to present with you this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Gale. Um, at this time, I want to invite uh, Mr. Johnson. I'm going to go right to Mr. Johnson. He got knocked off, so Mr. Heron, if you'll allow Mr. Johnson to just go. Um, Peter Johnson, you can know. Yes, right. Go ahead, Peter, and um, let's hear you from you. Are you hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear, Peter. Go ahead. Okay. I yeah. Well, good evening. Good evening to everyone. My name is Peter Johnson. And um, I've been invited a bit of my story, what I went through when I was younger. And um, I'll just give you just as it comes to me, you know. Um, when I was six years old, my mother gave me away to the the, well, the so children's service, the uh, CDA at the time it was. And um, I was placed in the Maxfield, Maxfield place of safety. And where I was transferred to the Swift Purcell Boys Home in St. Mary. Uh, that was about in the same year, not long after. And that is where I spent most of my childhood days there at Swift Purcell in St. Mary. Um, being a, a child that, well, basically, you know, ch children's home, it's like your, 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 it's like, your, your, their parents, is not, they don't need you, or you think that because your parents don't need you, or they rejected you, you understand? So um, I, had a, I had a feeling of abandonment and rejection which was really and truly how I felt. So um, as a result of that, I used to be rebellious and especially rebellious towards people who were, you know, in authority or who would want to show themselves like they are in authority over me. Like 
adults who would want to tell me what to do, I would have, I would have the attitude to say that you are not my mother, you are not my father, so you can't tell me what to do. Okay? So that was my outlook on everyone. And I never had any trust towards people, you know. Um, people would show me love, you know, genuine love. I, I've come to know now that the people would show me genuine love and I would shun them, uh, you know, run them, you know, because being a, a, a boy child as well, knowing that um, I'm, I'm, I don't have my mother or my father to love me and I'm thinking, then how are you trying to show me love? Uh, must be something you want. You understand? I'm thinking that maybe it's something someone is looking from me. Why would they would be nice to me? I try to show me love, you know. So that was my th um, outlook on people, you know, when they're trying to be nice to me, thinking that maybe they need something while they're being nice. So it's nice. So that's why I was always suspicious of people, no matter how genuine they were. All right. But being in the children's home. I used to, you know, um, some of the time I would run away and try to find like my mother because, you know, when the holidays come around, you'd have parents come and they would come and take their children, take their sons and bring them on holiday with them. And then uh, when the holiday finished, they would bring them back. So um, I would see this and, you know, every time this time come around, holiday time, Easter, Christmas, summer, I would run away and go try to find my mother because my mother was a woman that settled down by the um in the arcades in Kingston, Colonel Charles Arcade or any one of the arcades that I know I can find her. So from I go down my town and I start asking my mother and from I said the name, everybody knew her downtown. So no matter which part she will live or move to, we'll always find her. But the amazing thing about it is that Whenever they would find, I would find her, no matter where she moved to her, no matter how long I'd be there with her, they would, um, the child development agency would always find me. You know, so I was thinking that maybe it was my mother who was calling them and returning me back to them, you know, because how oh, would they know where she lived, you know, every time she moved. Yeah, so every time... I'd run away, I'd go back to, I'd find my mom. They'll come back and find me. I'd come and take me back to the children home back in St. Mary. So that um, kind of did really mess me up, really. You know, that rejection part of it. Where I, um, I think that, yeah, okay, then my mother don't need me. She don't need me. All right, so that's what I, uh, uh, the, the thought that I, developed in my mind as a child and I just it, it kind of hit me hard and at the time I didn't know that maybe that was why I behaved the way that I did you know no now I know that it was some of those things that I went through why I be, behaved the way I did you know so as a result of that I start misbehaving like over especially the people the staff at the children's home, you know, I'd um, be rebellious every time they talk, you know, I would, I would go against what they're saying, you know, purposefully, purposefully, isn't it? I'd, I'd go against it, purposefully, I'd just go against it, just to, you know, to say, all right, then, yeah, or maybe it was an attention type of, attention seeking, you know, on my part, so, but, I was rebellious, and especially when they try to tell me what to do, I do go against what they say and do the opposite thing. I understand? Yeah, so um, that it may hard, very hard, and even um, in school as well, I started misbehaving in school because I, I was a bright child in, in school, and even a lot of times the teacher would jam on one side, you know, and say, you know, Peter, you, you, you look on your grades them and show me all my grades them. And I said, look, here, you, you can do better in class, you know, like, you know, you just need to focus because my, my grades them always up. But like some classes that I don't like, I'll just deliberately not take part in them and I'll give you a trouble in class and support. You understand?
But um, the part about my mother, really and truly, um, I, I just, um, you know, I felt like even like the boy, boys nowadays, really and truly, they need um, support systems of not just only mothers, but mothers and fathers. Because I believe that um, the mothers, them, you know, when a mother alone raising a child, she do all that she can to let the child have what he wants. But when it comes to the discipline part of it, the mother sometimes they're soft, you know. Not saying that all mothers are soft, you know, but um, I believe that um, the, the um, boys need fam um, father figures as well around them. You know, to, to 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 teach them certain things, you know, certain manly things, you know, to be firm and, you know, in, and make in making decisions and stuff like that, you know. And I'm even, so sorry, yeah, yes, Peter. Um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop back over to Mr. Heron, and I I want to hear your story, Peter, um, from 17 going up when we come back. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do do stay tuned because Peter has a story to tell. And okay. a very interesting one. Um, Peter, did you know your father? Do you do you know your father? No, I didn't know my father. I, I never met him. I've never even seen a picture of him, I have to say. So I don't know who the guy is, you know. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> uh, Mr. Heron, over to you, sir. We look forward to hearing the rest of your story, Peter. Um, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that. Um, really quite interesting. Um, you know, Mrs. Wilma, while, while Peter was speaking, one of the things that that jumped out at me, at me was the, similar, the, the similarity between his story and the stories of many of, of, um, of my former students while, while being at, um, both a dean of discipline and a guidance counselor. It, it, it is really airy how, how, how similar it was, you know, and the pain that, that, that many of our students would have, um, would have been feeling. <clears throat> But I, I also want to focus for a bit on, on um, as, as, as would have been said in my introduction, I was a dean of discipline for a number of years. And my, my colleagues, my colleagues, dean of discipline across the island would have been doing tremendous work. There are, there are over 130 deans of discipline across the island um, in, in that number of, of high schools. And the interesting thing is that, I don't know if you would have, you would have all remembered, the, the, the so-called prison study that was done some time ago, is that there's a dean of discipline in every single one of those schools that, that participated in the prison study. And the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of those schools, they continue to have high levels of indiscipline. The, the interesting thing, however, is that most of the students who participate in disciplinary activities are boys. Not, there are no girls involved, of course, but the majority of them are boys. Now, when the program would have started across the island, the, the, the view on discipline and on, on the rule of the dean of discipline would have been punitive, would have been a heavy hand. And that, was not, that has not been working. And so deans have crafted various programs. A lot of them are, are focused on boys. I'm not going to focus on my program alone. But there are several deans would have focused on several programs that focus specifically on boys. And as Peter would have mentioned, Peter said in his story, a lot of those stories, um, rejection, abandonment, feelings of simply not being wanted, not knowing their father, not feeling love from their father, not knowing their mother, or not knowing, not feeling love from their mother, are also a, a, a high degree of, of anger towards the mother, whether the mother is a single parent or not. No, we know that there are other factors that affect the, the, the mother as a single parent. But, but, but the similarities across all the schools was crazy. One major similarity, there's only one boy school, by the way, one boy school. And the other similarity is that in most of these schools, the boy population, the male population, numbered more, significantly more than the female population. And so I personally look at a lot of schools, the so-called um, inner city schools, so-called schools and not the non-traditional schools. And what, we were, what, we, what, what I found is that most of those schools 
they had more boys and girls. Most of those schools that had disciplinary issues always had more boys and girls. Now, it, is, it, it talks about our system and how we respond as a system and as individuals within the system. Our teachers respond. Our teachers try very, very hard. But our teachers are extremely overwhelmed with how they respond to boys and their knowledge of responding to boys. Yes, there are, there are individual teachers who, who really go the far away, go the extra mile. There are individual teachers who, who, who simply have that knack. But the system has not trained our teachers how to respond to boys specifically, how to respond to disciplinary matters, not just where boys are concerned, how to respond to the, to the little nuances within our schools, the, the girlfriend, boyfriend thing within our schools that is affecting a lot of our indiscipline. Our teachers are not trained. So I am putting this to our teachers' colleges. And I've been saying for a very long time that this has to be a part of their curriculum. It has to be a part of their curriculum or else our teachers, in, they're not ready for the classroom. And I feel the same way as many of our boys and our girls as well. They are not ready for the classroom. Likewise, many of our teachers are not ready for the classroom to teach our boys and girls. We're not talking about delivering a math or a Spanish or the English, just simply teaching to our students, specifically to our boys. And we have to respond systematically because it is only going to get worse. The deans alone cannot do it. The deans alone have been doing a tremendous job. Some teachers as well have been doing an excellent job, right? But it is not enough. It's not enough to have boys coming to our schools, having already been exposed, as, as Dr. Gay would have pointed out, to the high numbers of ACEs, right? We have several boys who are already members in gangs, who are already running gangs at their age, at 16, who have been exposed to weapons. And I'm not talking and I speak, right? And how, how does a teacher respond to that young man? It's next to impossible. Especially when you delve further. And I, I, when I, I'm going to break shortly. And when I come back, I'm going to go back into the primary schools. Right? But when these boys, by the time they get to our high schools, they would have already gone through years of experiencing reject, pain, anger in our education system, not to mention at home or within the community. And so we need to respond. Right? We need to respond specifically. Deans, some deans have excellent programs and they're responding. It's not enough. It's not enough because they're also losing out on their education in the meantime. So, Mrs. William, I'm going to stop there um, and I'll allow others to, to partake. Thank you so much, Mr. Heron. Really, really appreciate that. I'm going to go back to Dr. Gale. And from Dr. Gale, I'll go back for Peter to continue his story. Uh, Professor Rosalie Hamilton has joined us. We want to hear from you. And Professor Hamilton, I know you've been doing quite a bit out in the field. Just good to have this conversation going. And of course, we are, we're seeing the chat. We're seeing the participation. Keep them coming. Your voice matters. Dr. Gale, over to you, sir. All right. Uh, let me go back to, to sharing. I, I want to... This time I want to show you a little bit of just some issues about some of the preoccupations of boys. So in 2001, in a class uh, at SOAS London, uh, we set out to find out what is it that make boys or girls, for that matter, young people stable. And uh, we covered 127 uh, countries uh, developing countries uh, in my class from the 17 of us who were violence students, who were trained to be violence experts. And uh, this is what we found. We found that uh, there are four things that children really need to be stable. Food, a safe environment, supportive parents, education and training. But if you come to Jamaica immediately, and Belize is just the same, and Trinidad. Trinidad is a little bit better, but it's not far off. If you go to the survey of living conditions 2014, you will see where from birth to five years old, boys are 2.7 times more likely to be underweight than girls. 
If you go to the UNICEF study, 2004 study, you will see that girls are twice more likely to be comprehensively breastfed than boys. So we actually have a slavery passed down problem and a problem that has been compounded by our, the fact that we're the fourth most violent country in the world, which forces us to protect women extraordinarily and to be, and, and, and of course, to raise our boys to be tough. If you look at this idea of safe environment, you will understand boys and the state. In Jamaica, let me take you to Black Lives Matter a little bit. So in the United States, the police in the United States accounts for 1%, 1% of every Black man who is killed. In Jamaica, the Jamaican state accounts for 13% of every Black man who is killed. Eh? Black lives matter, don't? A lot of us jump up about Black lives matter in the United States without understanding that we're 13 times worse. If you look at the issue of supportive parents, we, we will see that tons and tons of the material you get from people are actually erroneous. 37%, when you go to the most violent communities, 37% of their fathers are dead or in prison and 15% of their mothers. And when you look at education and training, you're going to see something else, but I'll take you through this very quickly because I want to do this in just a few minutes. If you take the GBV, and most Jamaicans have no idea what gender-based violence means, they actually think that, think that gender-based violence means a man hitting a woman. And if you Google GBV, you will see a man hitting a woman. That's the power of selling propaganda. Campaigners are very good at flooding a platform to the point where truth is no longer important. Here are the data for Jamaica. The number one victim of violence in Jamaica, 80% are men between eight, 18 and 69. The number two grouping are boys, birth to 17 plus years old, 9.1% before we get to women. All right? And that always seems to shock people because that's not what they hear in the media. That's not what's happening in their ears. What's happening in their ears, as soon as you type in GBV, you see a man with a big fist and a woman. That happens, right? That happens 1.78% of times in Jamaica. 1.78% of murders in Jamaica comes from that group. And many persons do not want to discuss the other 98.4%. And that's what, where it goes crazy. That's the block. I'll go through it very quickly. Father presence, mother presence. And I want us to spend 90 seconds on this. The national figures from the survey of living conditions, and if you buy a pin from statin and, and go through it yourself, you will see that Jamaica has 82% of our children have a mother in their home and 42% of the father. Always think twice more. Mothers are twice more present. When you go to an inner city, I want you to look very carefully. From the 1960s until now, we've been writing this garbage that the mothers are present in the inner city and only the fathers are absent. I beg of us all to stop. Here are the data for Jamaica. Fathers drop by 50% down to down to 21% in terms of presence in the lives of children, and mothers drop from 82 down to 43, which is almost as significant. So inner city children, inner city boys actually lack father presence and mother presence. So who is taking care of them? They are taking care of themselves, their siblings are taking care of themselves, and grandma or grandpa taking care of them. Certainly not mothers and fathers. And that's the center of the crisis. But the crisis is not a father problem, it's a parental problem. If you look at inner city males who kill, you will see something. The father, 21%, drops significantly to 17%. The mother, not drops, it, it literally dives from 43% to 21%. Boys who kill have a nightmare with their mothers. The mothers are either absent or abusive. Those are the hardcore facts. If you look at the girls in my data set, 64 of them who've killed somebody, you will see that they have a nightmare, not with their mothers so much, but with their fathers. Very different from the way we've been looking at these things. When you take boys who are shielded, like I grew up in Savlamar being shielded, where if you try to, 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 to beat me or take my lunch money in Savlamar when I was growing up as a nerd, the, the, the people on the street would actually attack you, including boys who are in gangs. 
If you look at boys who've been shielded, who've had the luxury or privilege of being shielded, you'll see that they are so very different from high-risk boys. 17 times less likely to come from a crime family, 5.4 times less likely to be tortured, 3.6 times less likely to be hungry and desperate, 3.1 times less likely to have come from families where your parents are always fighting, 2.7 times less likely to drop out of school, and 2.5 times less likely to be burdened by everybody asking you for money, which pushes you into violence. Let's look at Montego Bay and Kingston very quickly. 27% of the boys in Montego Bay in the 2018 study were hungry, right? All the way through, you can see it. All the way, you can, you can see that there's an immense burden. Look at the boys who are asked to be, their, to be the, 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 the number one earner in their family. And if you look at that, it, 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 it makes you go crazy. If you take then an index on, and you take food, you take parenting, you take sense of safety and opportunities and create an index called the ontological security index or sense of future index, you'll see something. Shielded boys, only 10% of them, right, had a problem in terms of chronic hunger. For low, low violence boys, 21%. Look at shutters and high, shutters being the repeat killers and high violence, half of them are hungry chronically and persistently. If you look at, at the boys who are carrying their families alone, that's the third set of blocks, you'll see 17% of the boys, these are boys, kids carrying their families alone. They are the only person employed. How can you be employed as a child and be able, right, to be carrying your family alone and be able to have a future? All right? Now, if you look at the fallout in families, when families are devastated, I'm going to take you through the process of what happens in a home when that family is devastated, when the father has lost his work or has died and the family sinks into, into economic chaos. Step one, the mother pressures the father so he leaves if he cannot earn after, after three months and, a, and a, a father goes and she tries to replace the, fa the half a man with a full man. And sometimes she ends up with a quarter man. Work that out for yourself. Step two, the mother does a second job or becomes employed if she was not employed. Step three, she stops the boy from going to school and keeps the daughters in school and the boys hustle. Please see if you can get access to Hustling and Juggling, the Art of Survival for the Urban Poor that I wrote in 1994. Step four, the mother our father sends one of the children to another relative or in foster care. You've, you've, you've heard enough right? From Peter. Step five, the mother takes on a second partner or enters into part-time sex work. And step six, the mother pimps the daughter. And that is why we are able, we can tell you that daughters are so protected that by the time a daughter is being pimped by a mother, that family is already, the entire family structure has been destroyed. So if you look at the work of my Belizean friends and myself who are, who are, are on, on the link with us, you'll see some things about boys who are hustling. 21% in Trinidad, 21% in Belize, 24% in Jamaica. Hosting boys and working children are indicators of family crisis. Boys are visible, but girls are hidden and more difficult to calculate. Have to look at the girls who are, who are what we call new age slaves in the homes of people, right? Not just boys. The boys by nature of their hustle and are extensively, are seriously, extremely vulnerable. If you look again, you see earning boys take their money home to their mothers and grandmothers. The bulk of the money is that they hustle on the street when they are wiping and swiping at the, at the stoplight is not kept in their pocket. It's been given to their mothers and grandmothers. And half of that money is used to send the girl to school. We have a dilemma. Hustling boys are likely to engage in sex early. Hunger is the most critical push factor and bad relationships with parents the second. Hustling boys are the most likely to be aggressive and to join gangs. And hustling boys and enslaved girls have low life chances. If you can understand that, you can understand why we are so concerned about boys when they are hungry, about boys who are carrying the burden of their families, right? That is where the problem is. And I will just show you when you look at inner city communities from Manchester, from, from St. Catherine, and St. Andrew and Kingston, this is what it looks like. 
14% of boys are shielded compared to 32% of girls. All right. 30% of boys are low violence, are low exposure to violence compared to 44% of girls. What you'll see is a continuous picture of the girls being shielded, as, as Janet Brown and Barry Chavans would say, you lose the bull, you tie the heifer. There's a tremendous, the more violent a community becomes, the more girls are shielded. When you look at the entire index, you see that shielded boys have a 77% chance after being tracked over a 10-year period of accessing in university and, and have access to, to anything, to something that presents them with a sense of future compared to a 24% of the boys who from very early had, were drawn into gangs or become shutters. That is the core of our problem. And I'll pause there because we've already looked at the education dilemma. Thank you so much, Dr. Gale. And um, there's just so much more to learn as we look at, you know, the years coming up. And the question is, what has changed? And if so, uh, what is it looking like today? Now I'm going to go over to Mr. Johnson. We've heard from Dr. Gale. We've heard from Mr. Heron. We're not going to go back to Mr. Peter Johnson as he continues his story. Mr. Johnson. Um, would have sheared up to the point of, uh, you know, running away back to his mom. Now he's 17. What's next, Mr. Johnson? Did we lose him? Hope he didn't get knocked off again. Let me see if I can find. Peter, are you with us? Seeing he has got knocked off again um, based on his internet. And so I am... I'm going to try to see if I can admit him again as we recognize there's a challenge with the room. Just to remind you that the room for those who are in and your, your friends or colleagues are trying to get in, just be reminded that the YouTube channel is live. We are streaming live from JTC YouTube channel. And for the persons who are asking for the video, remember that the video will be available there. Even at the end of the session, you can access it. You can share with your friends. All right, we're now moving over. Um, I'm not sure, Professor Rosalie Hamilton, do you, do you want to share at this point? And then I'm going to go right back to Mr. Mr. Heron. And we want to hear the end of Peter's story because it ties in with what we're talking about today and evidence of the system and what's going on. And the question is, having heard this, what, what do we do? How do we move forward? Professor Hamilton, do you? No, no comments right now. Excellent no. forum, and I'm listening. All right. So over to you, Mr. Heron. Thank you, Mrs. Wilmot. Um, I'm pretty much just going to back up on the ground, what, what Dr. Gay would have been talking about, but also specifically, um, I wanted to touch on be, be, before the boys, before our students start high school and within the family, we would have known that once, <clears throat> once there are two children involved, boy, girl, the boy automatically gets less attention, less love than, than the girls. Case in point, specifically as it relates to reading and education, the boys, Dr. Gary made reference to, 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 to tie the heifer and lose the bull. And that is regard, specifically regard to reading. The parents will sit down with their girls and read. You know, daughter in daddy lap, mommy um, have daughter in lap. Not the same with boys. You know, because boys will go up and run up and down, climb tree and do whatever they're supposed to do, right? Um, likewise with homework, have the time, the patience to sit down with the girl picnic and do our schoolwork. Not the same with the boys. This is before they get into our education system, right? The patience with the girls is much, much higher than those that than the patience with the boys. We don't reach another education system yet. We don't reach where the work gets hard, we don't reach high school yet. We don't reach there as yet. This is simply primary school, I'm sorry, basic school, kindergarten, right? They are showed less affection. So when when you reach school and you're expecting our boys to, to, to express themselves, why, how, what have you put in place? What have we put in place 
expect our boys to express themselves. When, uh, from home, for the most part, Dr. Gaywood has pointed to how many boys and girls are underparented within certain communities. These certain communities are the ones that feed the over 130 schools where Dean and Discipline are present, where some of our primary schools are having major issues, right? And our system is not responding. Our system is overwhelmed and not able to respond. Yeah? So going to our classrooms, where many of our classrooms are packed pre-lockdown, Go into our lockdown system now. Yes, we're reopening for face-to-face. -face. But during the lockdown, how many boys were engaged compared to how many girls? Significantly twice as many boys were unengaged, were unaccounted for as girls. Why? Is it because of, is it because they have some bad breed boy them? Or is it our system? Is it our family system? Is it our education system? There are answers. The answers require time. The answers require patience and answers require money. We need more educators in our system. I will also need parenting values to change, parenting strategies to change. We also need more fathers involved. And there are, there are so many factors that affect and influence father involvement and father valuing. As a country, we don't, we have not developed the, the, the appreciation of how to value father involvement. Simple and basic. Very, very different from how mothers are. Yeah. And how do we do that? So I'm going to stop there, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Wilma, if you allow me, and we can come back to this at some other point in time. But if we don't realize that where our boys are starting, coming from our homes into our education system, into our primary schools, Literacy is one major factor. The, the books the boys are being given, they don't necessarily match them, their temperament, their, their psychology, their emotional state. It, doesn't, it, it don't match them. But yet we're expecting them to read. We're expecting them to, to, develop, up, to develop an interest. And where boys are interested, they do well. Right? And that is not limited. That's not a gender thing. Anybody, if they give them a book and they're not interested, they're going to struggle. That is not brain science. So there are simple solutions. There are some low hanging fruit that we can address and deal with. Yeah. And the other things are way more complex, but we can work with the low hanging fruits first. Family structure and our education system. Yes, it is complicated, but we can start somewhere. I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much, Mr. Heron. Uh, Mr. Peter, Peter has found his way back online. Don't know where he went off to and come back. Maybe on the beach, he was searching Mr. Heron to see if he could get some of that cool breeze. Um, we're, we're winding down. We have just about 15 minutes to, to close the session and we want to hear Peter's story. So Peter, we're gonna ask you to share your story. And uh, Go ahead, welcome back. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks for having me back, um, Miss. Wilmot, Wilmot. William, Wilmot. Yes. Okay, so um, I've been listening to um, a lot of what's been said and all of that, you know, all kinds of, there's a lot of things that people can subject, suggest in a book, you know, in a textbook and things like that. But the, the, the hands-on part of it is totally different from what's in the book, you understand? And for me, really and truly, when I was, um, when I was, being shown a lot of rejection by my own mother when I went to when I would run away from the children's home back to her and every time that she would send me back. You know, that was my initial breakdown stage, you know, where it doesn't matter how much even the teachers tried with me at school, doesn't matter how the staff at the children's home would try, you know, I I I had made up there was a like a made up mind for me, you know, I was just rebellious, you know. As long as I wasn't getting that love from my mother, I wasn't um, open to change. I wasn't open to listen to anything anyone was saying. I wasn't going to take heed to that. You understand? So um, I, I just, I just, it's just something just like it. Something breaks within me, you know, and it just couldn't be fixed by 
all that was being done in schools and in the in the children's home or even by elders in the community that you know that just couldn't like fix it you understand it, it, it's just love could have fixed my problem because um, rejection was my hurt that was my pain and only love and the love from my mother only i think could have could have fixed that so um moving on from where i left off as i said i used to run away from the children's home and stuff and the last time i ran away was when i was 17 and they didn't bother come to look for me so um what happened is that i i went to i was staying with my mother in um the kingston 13 area and um basically what happened is that even though they didn't come and look for me again it's like she just couldn't stand me being around so she kicked me out again kicked me out you know as a as a 17 year old child and you know i was that was me back i was just like a, a street kid from that point and then i was in, involved in some stuff already you know growing up um unruly and rebellious but when I got kicked out that time, that's when it's like it's, I went full time into like the life of crime, you know, and a little being a, a little young youth in the community where I, I, I used to be, it was hard for me to get like to, 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 to get recruited by the gang members. And, you know, soon after, you know, one reaching them and, and where I go do things and, you know, they all about the place and it just wasn't it was it wasn't hard you understand it wasn't hard and there was no um there was no fee to be paid you know to enter the life of crime you know even though we know not that um our life is in danger and all that but it was just so easy to to to, to get into that type of lifestyle you know and soon after that i was um you know the community that i grew up in it was uh it was a labor right community basically and um what i noticed in this community was that whenever the time for election would come around you know it's like there's this automated system that got um activated where war just kick up every time um 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 the, the the election is to be called war just kick up between this side the jlp side and over there so that side the pnp side every time election it's just something that just happens it's just like it's like it's scheduled to happen it must happen it's had to happen you understand so things like that was like um what i had to be involved in so it's just like it's like politics were basically a war from what happened is that one of the time this there's a war going on the 2007 election was to be called um no the election, I don't remember the year the election was, but it was back in, you know, 2001, them time there. And um, the war started, and it's like one at a time, we make a walk go down to Kingston and me enter a certain area, which is PNP Stronghold, and somebody recognized me as being one of the members of the JP community, you understand, in Kingston 13, and I was attacked, you know, and near to the point of death, I was stabbed to the near to the point of death, where I spent a lot of time and um, some time in the KPH, Kingston Public Hospital. And soon after I got released from the hospital, my mother said, why she have to go take me out of the community, out of the life of crime. So long story short, I went to England and um, when I went to England, uh, my mother said I was going to my aunt's house in England. And as soon as my job in England at my aunt's house, she kicked me out, saying that she don't want anything to, anything to do with my mother or her children. Them. You understand? All right. He, he's not hearing us. I'm hoping that he'll be able to come back up soon. But... Um... Oh, he got kicked off his internet i suppose got bad so we just have to wait for him to come on but you know i really want you to hear um how peter ended up where he is today what he has gone through 
and I want you to hear from him. So I'm going to try to see if I can get him back in. We're wrapping up at this time. We're coming to an end. I'm going to ask each speaker before I close off. I'm going to ask each speaker to just give just about one minute as we, you know, that's your closing statement. I'm also going to invite Dr. Gordon to, to share with us. So I'm going to start with you again, I'm Dr. Gail, to just try and um, to go ahead and do your one minute wrap up, go over to, to Mr. Heron, Dr. Gordon, as we try to get Peter back on to share the rest of his story with us. I know the time is short, two hours run really fast, right? Um, yeah, over to you, Dr. Gail. All right, uh, I just want you to look at something as I close. And it's that when you use the nine, grade nine, the boys who drop out of school before grade nine as your baseline, the ones who parents love enough or have enough parental guidance or enough attention to complete three CXCs are four times less likely to be high risk. And if they go to Cape, they're 10 times safer than a boy who drops out of school by grade nine. And if they complete university or, or enroll in university, they're 85 times safer, which means that when you're looking at the plight of boys, we're talking about family and society investment. That's what it is. And here's a picture of the situation uh, that we need to address. Look at the all-girls schools. These are students who are going to be likely to finish to, to, to finish school and enter university, 89% for all girls school and look down at the new secondary 10% and for boys 3.4% in this group. That is where the crisis is. And I close by pointing out something to us that presents us a picture of hope, but also a warning. These are the data from the JCF that I have just crunched three weeks ago. What you will look at is not complicated. These are murders, firearms, uh, and, and shootings. Only 24% of the people charged have any form of training. If you train your boys, if you provide them with a space where they can learn, they are going to be fine. So let me close by saying we need to campaign for everybody. Simple, simple, simple. While we campaign and love and do all of these things that we're doing, it needs to include boys. It cannot be WAG only. The WAG only journey we are taking is going to leave us in the dark and in the pit of hell. We're not going to solve this problem with a WAG only policy. Take care. We have lost you, Mr. Gale, Dr. Gale. We're now on to we're now on to Mr. Heron, Dr. Mm -hmm. Gordon, and and um, then over to you, Mr. Heron. Are you ready to do your last your final one minute, sir? Sure. Uh, okay, I'm gonna get Peter back on. Yeah, man. So our education system and our family system, they 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 are national bodies that can address. I'm not sure how equipped they are to address these these issues. But specifically within our education system, I'm not sure. I, I, I left Teachers College many moons ago, so I, I can't speak to how our students are being prepared um, to deliver education to, to, to the nation's children. However, based on what I am seeing, I, I have a concern. I've always had a concern that our, our, our teachers, our student teachers are being prepared, those that end up at the traditional and non-traditional school, there's nothing specific to address, for example, the inner city boy, to teach to the inner city boy, to teach to, you know, to, 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 to address that. I'm not sure that is happening. If it is happening, I, I, I'm not aware that it is. Um, I know that there, there are programs surrounding literacy and students who are behind, who, who are, are pretty much functionally illiterate and stuff. But that is that that is not limited to the inner city, you know, and that is where as one of the issues that I think we need to to focus on um, the family structure, the various programs, our guidance counselors do tremendous work, but they're also overwhelmed. I'm not sure how much more can be done along that line. 
but it is critical that we respond. We respond. We're doing a lot of. We're working in, in a lot of silos. We have to come together and work. But if we take a lot of what out of the data that Dr. Gale would have just presented and use that to guide how we interact, how we prepare our boys, everybody, as he would have mentioned as well. And I'm not sure we're using that. I'm not sure. We, we, we are slowly becoming data-driven, but we need to pick up the pace. Simple as that, All right? So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Heron. I'm now gonna go over to Dr. Gordon. Ladies, gentlemen, the panel. I want to thank you sincerely for the rich discussion, for the new information. I am sure a number of us weren't aware of what is really happening. And when you show the data, what the data re reveal what this real situation is in our country. And it's not just Jamaica task now to deal with the problem, but what we have found out is that in all our developing countries, Wherever there's economic advancement, they seem to have a problem with the boys. This part of the country. So you have Nigeria, for example, they have a problem with girls in the north, but in Lagos, towards the sea, they have problems with the boys, you know, and where there's more economic development. The, thank you very much, gentlemen, for the sharing your experiences. Speaking of traditions in Jamaica, we have always supported girls. In my own family, my grandfather told me his father died when they were small and there were 11 of them, six girls and five boys. And the mother took the boys out of school, all of them, and kept the girls in school while the boys had to go and work to keep their sisters in school. When I met them in my life, the girls were educated and thank heavens, the boys were businessmen, but they could barely read because they were out of school. Once the father died, she took them out of school. You see how protective in our tradition, we have always protected our girls. And I think much of that tradition is still with us. I did some, an experiment in my own situation where I took a little boy who was begging and I'm so proud of him today. In fact, the outfit I'm wearing, he bought and sent to me. So I'm proud of that too. I took him off the street, he was begging. And I got another a group of people and we said, let us, we said, let us help him. Well, he, he was so bad that the others left in terms of his behavior. I was the only person left with him after he was expelled from the second school. He, expelled, he was expelled from three schools and the fourth school, thanks to Ray Howell at Edith Dalton James, Ray said, school is for the boy and that boy is going to stay here. And I can tell you the teachers rejected him so much that when Ray was sick for a month, the teacher, teachers got him out of the school for a month. Today, that boy has eight C-sex subjects. He was tapped the night before the examination and was in the hospital KPH when Ray said, teachers, we are going to set up something for him to do his examination. He did it as his examination, got his eight subjects. Today, he's an advisor in a BPO, which is nice shirt and tie. And that's the child. That child was so bright that no policeman could have caught him if he decided to go the criminal way. He was left to do that. And so when I look at him, every time I look at him, I say, our oh, boys need care, love, attention. And so you can imagine panelists, how happy I am to hear you this afternoon. Peter shared his experiences. And you can understand both sides of the story. You can understand his mother's side. You can understand his side. And then what are we doing as a country to help persons on both sides, sides of the fence, the boys and the parents? So I thank you sincerely. We are not just a group that talk. 
We are a group that acts. And as a group, we are going to continue to pursue activities, not just discussions, but activities that are directed towards helping our boys. I know that we are not supported by international agencies. We're not supported because they do not want to put boys on their agenda. And when the countries approach them for assistance with boys, they say no. So that is a dialogue that we as a country must take further. So they understand that if we have a problem with our boys, we need that problem to be treated from the funding, the grants and what and the loans that they make, because that's our problem. So the task we have to address on different levels, we can do it. And Jamaica is bold. I have recommended at different times some rezoning of some of our inner city schools so that they are attached to industries. So education is directly linked to industries. And I think that this minister of ours, Minister Williams is going in just that direction where she wants school to be meaningful in every sense of the word. And if meaningful school means attaching this, the schools, linking the schools more closely with the workplace, the industry, that is what she's going to do. Already, she has decided, of course, with the Ministry of Education staff agreeing that schools should be extended for two more years. Now, of course, teachers are nervous because some of those boys, they don't want them for two more years. They're frightened that they have to keep them for two more years. But then we, as JTC, we are working with the teachers, providing the mentorship program. That's why the mentorship program is so critical for teachers for, for, to have a, a bridge, to have um, a, a kind of mediation approach or mediatic approach in keeping our boys. So we spend time with them. We understand them. And panelists, I am inviting you to stand beside us every step of the way. We know that you have a lot to offer in guidance and to join with us when we try to mobilize resources and to direct those resources towards our boys. So I want to thank everybody on the panel sincerely for being here. And I can assure you that when this discussion is finished, we are going to look at the tape again and garner ideas that will help us to improve the situation of boys. As Dr. Gale said, when you clip the wings of men, a country cannot fly. And I support you strongly on that. If your men are not producing, participating in a positive way, it is hard to experience economic growth. It is almost impossible. And I learned that on an international platform when a Pakistani woman stood up and said, if our men are not engaged, our women are in deep problems. And we are seeing it here in Jamaica. All of the, many of the problems women have, they are associated with men because they are not meaningfully engaged. So we thank you. Thank you, thank you. And we look forward to your continued collaboration and support as we join hands and we pull in more hands to help us to turn Jamaican boys, all of them in the one direction towards success. And to, we are telling our teachers already, stop failing the boys. This big knot and red ink on the boys' paper, just, just stop it. If, if it's 10 out of, of 100, then it's 10% of, of progress. And we need to have that vision of progress, of growth, and not of constant F failures. In fact, I tell the teachers when you put F on the, on the paper, it means teacher fool fool. So just don't put the F on the paper. Don't fail the boys. You keep failing them, then they're going to feel like 
failures. So, and our teachers are coming along. They are understanding it. And they are, they, a lot of them, they are working with their boys. In fact, some of them are showing off on us now to say, yes, this is what my boy can do. This is what our boys can do. And we feel very good about it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mrs. Wilmot, thank you very much for this session. And the JTC staff on the, on the platform, thank you all. And I would like you to have a very wonderful evening and the evening is not over. Any ideas you have that you can share with us that will help us to put programs in place, to mobilize resources, build partnerships, to help our boys, we will be happy to hear from you. Thank you so Thank very you. much, Dr. Gordon. Yes, Peter is back. And I know like some of us, we want to hear the rest of the story. And so I'm going to please stay for a few minutes after. Remember that we have prizes. We have over $20,000 in phone credit to give away because tomorrow is Valentine's Day. We want to call our mommies for the little boys. We especially want to ensure that you get your, your credit and you would have been completing the form so we can reach out to you and send that money to you. So you can make your call for all our teachers. We have baskets, we have giveaways. Thanks again to Mr. Larkland Morley, one of our board members from the, Jamaica, from the Mentors Association of Jamaica. I'm going to invite at this time, Mr. Mr. Morgan, to Mr. Johnson to share his story, um, the abridged version of the ending of his story, um, the path he took to where he is today. Mr. Johnson, over to you, sir. Um, I don't know exactly where did I, where, what's the last thing you heard right. because so I was there how, talking. How, how did you, right, what, how did you end up in a life of crime, um, how you got into prison, how you got out, where are you today? Okay, so after I went, um, I, I ran away from the children's home. I was, um, I went back to my mother in um, the Kingston 13 area, that's where I, um, I, I developed that, where I started my career of crime like on a higher level than I used to. You know, I used to thief and do some little thing as youth, but where it was like more organized, you know, where there's a Dan and there's a sec right hand and there's a second in command and a third in command and where there's a chain of, you know, like our hierarchy in a business. Yes, yeah, something like that, similar to that. So, um, I started, um, the community that I lived in was a community where there's um, a lot, um, it's like a political type of community where it's leaning more to the JLP side and we're always in friction with the the next um, couple of street up the road, which is PN, leaning towards the PNP side. So as I was saying earlier, I didn't, I don't know if you guys heard it, that whenever there's an election, there was right. always like an automated you, system. You got that part, Peter, um, where you, you're now back from England. Well, you went to England, you got rejected. How did, why, why okay, did you so you, you guys heard all of that. Yeah, man, so, okay. you, right, so you're yeah, in England. so when I went to England and my aunt rejected me, my aunt rejected me, which that kind of, that kind of, and me, you know, because yeah, I'm, you know, my mother sending me to England, you know, even though basically and really and truly, it was I was given drugs to carry from Jamaica to England. It's not like I went on a free trip, you know. I, you know, mommy was like, oh, get my boy out of the place and send him go to a far, far land, you know, to live a good life. I had to carry drugs, you know, in order to get make that trip. You know, so it was not a free thing. You understand? So. You're breaking up, Peter. We're not hearing you. I think that we need to have another session where, Peter, you join us to finish your story because we really want to hear from you. And I think that it is a story that our boys need to hear. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to end here. But, but Peter, you you have a story to tell and one that can teach us just so much. So I'm going to ask that you, I'll stay in touch with you and we're going to join again as we continue the conversation to move into action as we love our boys, help our boys. So I'm going to be closing out with Dr. Gordon's requested song as we focus this afternoon on this whole, this whole 
um, very important point of loving our boys. If we love our boys, as Peter would have shared, you know, having that love where the, he knows he's loved, um, then we won't have a problem for them to reciprocate this. Remember that love is a verb. So we want to do love. We want our boys to know that we love them. So as we go, um, I want us, I want us to do love. I want to hear from you. The forms are there. We continue the chat. I'm going to allow a few persons to share. And I'm going to pause there. And just to say, I see some hands raised and I, I want to acknowledge those hands. So just to say that, um, you know, let us, let us do love. Let's show our boys love. And Jamaica will be the place where we all want to live, work, raise our families and do business. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you sharing with us at this time. I appreciate you, um, you know, coming out and just spending the afternoon with us. Remember to complete the form. We have prizes and we have gifts for you. Thanks again to our board member who would have made this possible. And we don't want to keep them, they're yours. So ensure that you complete the form. We have been, we have been, yes, Mrs. Mokna just, Mrs. Mokna is a president for the Mentors Association of Jamaica. And of course you would have heard from team members. And so I want you to complete that form. And then Peter, you raised your hand, go ahead. And I'm seeing other hands raised. I'm going to at this time um, say that it was just awesome. Really, really good to have had you. Thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. We will be having a follow up fireside conversation where if you have a wine of glass, you pull it out. Or if you have your chocolate, whatever it is that you prefer, as we have this very <laughs> conversation.